2018 Defense and Strategic Studies Plenary Session 2 on the theme Securing Professional Excellence Through Collaboration Military Stakeholders Approach to Security. It is my pleasure to introduce the chairperson of the session, Professor Nayani Melagode, Senior Professor in International Relations, Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo, to the audience. Currently, she is the Dean Faculty of Graduate Studies, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. She is also a member of the Task Force on Freedom of Navigation in the Indian Ocean, chaired by the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Lanka. She is a member of the Board of Management of Lakshman Kadiragama Institute for International Relations and Strategic Studies. Distinguished Fellow, the Institute of National Security of Sri Lanka, Ministry of Defence. Affiliated Researcher, Institute of Peace Science, Hiroshima University, Japan. And Country Expert, Sri Lanka, Variety of Democratic Projects, Local Knowledge, University of Gothenburg, Sweden, since 2015. She is a contributor to the Mahavansa Volume Six, the official record of Sri Lanka on foreign policy of Sri Lanka. While thanking her being here with us today, accepting our invitation, I now cordially invite Professor Nayani Melagode to the stage and chair the Defence and Strategic Studies Plenary Session Two. Meantime, I would like to call upon our eminent guest speakers in this plenary. Professor Yang Ho Kim, Director General Research Institute for National Security Affairs, Korea National Defence University, Korea. Rabbi Marshal Dr. Tatan Kustana. Vice Rector Three Cooperation and Interagency Relations, Indonesia Defence University, Indonesia. Professor Gavini Kiravel, Executive Director, Regional Centre for Strategic Studies. Brigadier General Hamid Shafiq, Director General of Operations and Training, Integrated Headquarters, Maldives National Defence Force, and Deputy Director General of National Counter Terrorism Centre, Maldives. Major General Dato Abdul Rahim bin Haj Muhammad Yusuf, first holder of the leadership chair, leadership chair office, National Defence University, Malaysia. Professor Nayani Melagode will also introduce the presenters of the session to the audience. Madam, what is? Thank you very much for that kind introduction. It is uh, indeed a pleasure. Uh, to chair this plenary session two on defence and strategic studies at the General Surgeon on Kotalavla Defence University's 11th International Research Conference on Security Professional Excellence Through Collaboration, Military Stakeholders' Approach to Security. Uh, now security uh, is uh, academic branch in international relations. coming under strategic studies and strategic studies is very important but the defin definitions of strategic studies and security studies sometimes overlap each other richard k betts defined strategic studies exemplify exemplified by three concentric circles military science that is a uh, combining technologies organizations and tactics to win battles in the center and outer circle represents security studies everything related to security of the entire society national as well as human security as research extensively by many researchers including Barry Busan David Baldwin uh, Richard K Betts etc in the middle or in the bit uh, or in between strategic studies which is mutual interaction of political goals and military assets influenced by social economic and other limitations now bets points out since strategic studies are in the middle circle that this should become the most important sub branch of international relations 
The position of strategic studies depends on the definitions of security. As students of uh, defense and security studies, I'm very sure most of you are aware of the Penguin International Dictionary on International Relations, uh, the security uh, definition of security, a term which denotes the absence of threats and scarce values. Now, there are so many other definitions, but I found that the Russian Federation rules of law related to security is a good definition where the term security is defined as defense of the vital interest of individuals, society and state from internal and external threats. Then the vital interests are also defined as the totality of needs which enable existence and ensure the progressive development of individuals, society and the state. So, without taking much time, we have uh, five presentations addressing security, defense, military, and strategic studies this afternoon. Let me now introduce the first presenter in this session. The first presenter, please excuse me if I mispronounce, I'll try to pronounce it as accurately as I can, uh, is Director General, Research Institute for National Security Affairs, Korean National Defense University, Korea, which is called KNDU, Yang Ho Kim. He is also a professor at the Department of International Relations at KNDU. His major areas of teaching and research interest include foreign policy and security affairs of Northeast Asia. Also, Republic of Korea, U.S. relations, and international security issues. Professor Kim has received his Ph.D. and M.A. in political science from the Ohio State University in USA and his B.A. from the Department of Political Science and Diplomacy at Yonsei University, Seoul, Korea. Prior joining the KNDU, Professor Kim worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Merchant Center for Education in National Security in Ohio, USA, and as an instructor at the Department of Political Science of OSU. He also worked as a research professor at the Research Institute of Unification Studies in Yonsei University. He served as the Deputy Secretary to the President for Security Strategy uh, in Korea and also as policy advisor to the chief secretary to the president for foreign policy and security. He was a visiting research fellow at Rajaratnam School of International Studies in Singapore. Professor Yang Ho Kim will make his presentation on reconciliation between two Koreas, process and prospect. Professor Young, you have 15 minutes to make your presentation. I'm really glad and honored to be here and, uh, and also to be part of this uh, distinguished panel today uh, on this uh, important subject matters. But frankly speaking, I think uh, this subject about Northeast Asia, especially the North Korean nuclear problems, is somewhat uh, kind of a feel distinct, uh, distinct from you, your concerns, immediate concerns. Uh, so maybe it's uh, not that serious to you, feel uh, not that serious to you, all of some of you, but it is very important to us. And, uh, and also I would like to emphasize it's not just a matter of uh, security for our uh, neighbor, but it's also whole re region of the Asia and also the Indo-Pacific Indo area, uh, if not the global. So uh, I hope you... Uh, pay attention to my presentation, if it's not that uh, uh, fantastic one, but uh, uh, I hope and also you can learn from uh, my presentation a little bit. Okay, let me start. Uh, actually, yes, <coughs> maybe I should I shoot? Shoot? Oh, Stop moving. It always happens. The computers. I don't think this is a smart one, but uh, people always assume this is a smart one. 
But usually it's not that smart, <laughs> when it's, especially when it needed to. So uh, that's why actually I usually uh, depend upon, still depend upon writing uh, in my handwriting. But uh, these days I cannot avoid you know, using this uh, fancy technology. So I'm moving on. Okay. So the, as you can see in the table of contents, uh, I will actually briefly uh, actually uh, present the, the snapshot history of the inter-Korean relations very briefly, and then uh, the current historic situation of the transformation into the from the armistice uh, system to the peace permanent, more permanent uh, peace uh, system in, in Korean Peninsula, and then third, uh, our current president Moon, his administration's policy to North Korea, and then. Uh, lastly, I will mention about the, the future out outlook of the ongoing process of the denuclearization and also the reconciliation of the Korean Peninsula. Okay, uh, but uh, given the limited time, I don't know. I don't want to dwell on the, the past. So this is a very, uh, very, very brief uh, his history of the inter-Korean relations. It all started with uh, incomplete, incomplete in inter independence. Uh, by incomplete independence, I mean it's not done by ours, our power, Korean power. It's done, it was uh, as actually uh, an outcome of the end of the Second World War, especially with Japan. So the, for the military expediency, the Soviet Union and the United States came to the Korean Peninsula to disarm uh, Japanese imperial armies. So they divided the, our Korean Peninsula into two parts. So north part, northern part, it was a job for the North Soviet Union. The south, southern part, it's a job for, it assigned, it was a, the job was assigned to the United States. That's how it started. So that's why this, the, all dynamics of the division, confrontation, and also the reconciliation process is depending upon the outside dynamics, security, diplomatic, economic dynamics of the, you know, the outside world. So it's not just on our own to decide these uh, matters that concern this one. Okay, and then unfortunately, this kind of externally imposed, imposed uh, division and confrontation actually was internalized by Koreans uh, participating actually as a main party to the Korean War. So that's actually, during that war, they, were, they, com uh, they committed many atrocities and violence. So due to that kind of uh, you know, violence and atrocities, personal and emotional antagonism against each other was actually deeply rooted in our mind. So it hinders the reconciliation process more difficult. So, and, and then after that, uh, during almost you know, the 40 years of the division, in that period, the two regimes in each side actually kind of competed vehemently so it exacerbated, it exacerbated uh, the, our relationship more, more badly. So that's uh, actually that kind of antagonism and confrontation and competition lasted until the end of Cold War. Uh, it was a time, the end of Cold War, after the end of Cold War, the uh, position, posture, and also even uh, actually mindset toward each other has changed, started to change. So the, uh, the end, at the end of the war, after the end of the war, I'm sorry, the, because of the mainly the economic power of, by South, Korean, South Korea, we tend to be more lenient and more engaging and more actually kind of more permissive and more generous to North Korea. But uh, on the other hand, North Koreans felt completely differently, completely opposite side, went opposite side. They felt very threatened, nervous, and so they very defensive. So they actually kind of uh, uh, tried to focus on increasing their military power, especially with the asymmetric uh, military capabilities, like you know, some attacking submarines, special forces, and also nuclear weapons and political missiles. That's how it all started. I mean, how this kind of you know, recent uh, tensions in our peninsula and also the region has started because of that region. Okay, and then let me start with uh, uh, talking about this current situation. As you can see, this is uh, actually the historic things going on in around, on and around our peninsula. Uh, uh, we can point to the, at least I mean, two things. Uh, we have uh, two summit meetings 
in April and May. So as you can see, the, the pictures, these are the, the first one is the, the actually it's kind of demarcation line between South and North Korea. There is a, a the house for the negotiation called Panmunjom. The building uh, behind these two leaders, the, the blue buildings, that's the small building. It's inside there, there is a table for the negotiation for the each side, both sides. So actually only in this side, in, in, the, in this building, actually we can cross this uh, the line. But uh, outside of the building, we cannot cross this line. So the, the South Korean President Moon Jae-in and the North Korean Chairman uh, Kim Jong-un approached to each other and then shaking hands and then Kim Jong-un actually crossed over to the South for the first summit meeting. And then they went, they, he come down to the outside and they, we have uh, another building for the negotiation and also interactions. So they went into that building and that's, uh, the second picture shows the inside building. And they met and shaking hands. And then the next to the, this uh, blue, blue uh, colored building, so-called import, uh, now it became very famous. It's a blue bridge. In the bridge, they uh, actually, without any, you know, the uh, attendance of any other, uh, his aides, both aides, when they actually talk to each other, frankly, about an hour. So in, it's kind of a historic site and uh, picture. And it, this is the second one. It, it, it happened in May. This time, it's, uh, our president went over to the north side, northern part, and the, the crossed the, you know, the line, and then went over the, to the northern side. And then there is another building for North Koreans. So actually, they get, he went into the inside, and they had a you know, meeting. After the meeting, they actually kind of, you know, hugging each other. The, the second important thing, it was a, an also historic thing. It was the U.S. DPRK Singapore summit meeting, right? As you, you all imagine, President Trump and uh, Kim Jong Un they met together. But these kind of historic events didn't happen at once, so without any kind of uh, efforts, background efforts. Uh, it actually started with the President Moon, his inauguration. He he was uh, inaugurated in May 2017, last year. So just right, uh, right after his inauguration, he actually visited to the Berlin and then after he announced his plan for the uh, kind of the improvement of the inter-Korean relations. So that we called it Berlin Initiatives. It basically emphasized the coexistence and co-prosperity and the peaceful ways of the solution of the, the North Korean nuclear programs. And then North Korean side, actually uh, with uh, all those uh, you know, numerous tests uh, after his uh, kind of taking power, Kim Jong Un, Chairman Kim Jong Un actually, you know, that, uh, announced last year, November 22nd, 29th, he announced that finally we reached to the point that we can, you know, we succeeded in everything in the developing those nuclear weapons. So after that, he started to change his actually kind of policy lines, moving toward more like, you know, the emphasizing economic development. So the, early this year, the first day. New Year's Day, he announced that I will focus more on the economic development. And then he also mentioned about the improvement in the Korean relations. That was the moment, actually kind of some move, actually it underlined, underwent actually this whole process. And then a uh, timely event was the Pyeongchang Winter Olympic Games. In that games, it was a natural kind of, you know, the setting, they can actually get together and, uh, you know, we can, we can get together and talk to each other and interact with each other and uh, have better relationships. It all happens and then after a special attack, special envoys, you know, we had, uh, went to the North, I mean, North Korea and North Koreans come, come, came down to the south and then they meet together. This is the pictures. So just it's the first one, the North Koreans came down. The lady here is uh, the Kim Jong-un's sister, actually. So the only sister, uh, the only sister. So they, She's a very big, uh, important person. And then the second one is we, our team went up to the North Korea and met the, the Kim Jong, Chairman Kim Jong, and they actually, you know, he, one of the, this picture is, he's uh, the, actually, director of the, our uh, security advisor, I mean, um, special advisor to the, security advisor to the president, Jong Yong. Okay, why this is, how did it happen? This is important part. I think this is a four factors. Uh, this is why this is important because these four factors continuously affect uh, the future dynamics of this current process of the denuclearization and also the reconciliation. 
So the, I actually identified four things. First one, it was a growing effect of the international sanctions. It's the united front of sanctions by all international communities, all international uh, actually community, including China, it actually uh, started to take bite. It's not painful yet, but it's not agonizingly painful yet, but it started to bite. And so within maybe five or six years later, it's going to be really pro problematic to North Korean economy, which, led, which will lead to the, some kind of uprising among the people, possibly. I mean, it's not that easily done in a uh, country like in Korea, I mean, it's North Korea, but uh, considering the economic situation in North Korea, it can happen. So that's uh, one thing. The second thing is a uh, demonstration of the North, uh, U.S. military forces and also the unpredictability of, as you all know, the, the President Trump. So his uh, unconventional style of the you know, decision making and also the, his kind of, you know, some like you know, it's, uh, uh, pushing uh, tactic of uh, negotiation, blunt actually negotiating tactic, actually it worked. So that's because you know it made it made the uh, North Koreans scary. Actually, it's not just demonstration. Maybe Trump will use it. That kind of worry actually made made them come to the table. Third factor is the facilitating role of the Moon, President Moon and also his administration. So the, he is a very sincere person, even though the, in our country, in South Korea, opposition leaders, uh, even though they are opposed to the, the current Moon Jae-in administration policy, but they like Moon Jae-in as a person. He's a very sincere uh, person, and he's, a, and he's a real gentleman. So everybody respect that. And so I think that that kind of character actually helps uh, Kim Jong, both Kim Jong-un and also the President Trump think uh, when they think about the you know, negotiation and the sincerity of the, the kind of the you know, proposals or suggestion by the Moon Jae-in. And then fourth one is uh, finally, I think this is the most important thing, the Chairman Kim's actually decision. This is a very con controversial part. Still many people actually wondering whether uh, Kim Jong-un, Chairman Kim Jong-un made a strategic decision to give it up, all his uh, nuclear weapons and uh, ICBMs. Well, it depends. But I think uh, he made it. Why? Because I don't think he's uh, a newborn person. He suddenly he became a new, nice, I mean, kind person. No, I don't think so. He's very smart and very well articulated man. He's very clever. So he knows how to handle the power, how he console, how how to consolidate his power. So if, as I said earlier, if sanction goes continues continuously, it's, he's going to be in trouble. And also the another thing is that he he also had a you know. Strong confidence, okay, sorry, sorry, uh, in making his own, you know, nuclear weapons. So that's uh, because, the, and so actually, you know, he decided to uh, give, give it up, uh, take a risk or take a gamble. Okay, but this is the third part is the moon of defense policy. I don't want to, uh, I mean, explain it. Actually, you can, you can see this one from the, uh, actually, the handouts later. So what's going to happen? Actually, many things is going on right now. Actually, we achieved some actually important things, especially the hotlines, the communication channels. We restored it, and also the some exchanges is going on already. It started, but the problem is here. The problem is first one is sanction. We cannot go actually kind of you know more aggressively about the exchanges and the interaction with North Korea between the two Koreas because international sanctions uh, prevent us from actually invest even you know, the money in the infrastructure development, or the, you know, some kind of, that kind of, the, say, we cannot send any kind of help, material help, directly to North Korea. That's the first level. The, set, the more important thing is actually different view on the relationship among three things I, I mentioned here. Actually, there are three important goals in this process. Denuclearization, first one. Second one is improvement into Korean relations. Third one is peace, pro peace process on the Korean Peninsula. So the, all these three has to uh, very close, actually interlocking relations. So that is uh, actually most uh, Americans and uh, some conservatives in South Korea, they want to see first denuclearization by, uh, some move for the denuclearization by North Korea first. It's kind of sequential view. But uh, our current administration and North Koreans, 
So some people in South Korea who actually rooting for this kind of you know, so improvement of inter-Korean relations, they emphasize we have to do it together, simultaneously. That's a big difference in view. So that's the main hurdle right now. So, but actually, it's the, the whole process is mainly actually moved by the top leaders, that positive side. So we can still have a hope. Okay? So that's the thing. And then the main direction, I think, the main key is still mistrust among all parties. So how can we uh, start to build gradually, at least uh, means slowly but you know, gradually, this kind of building the confidence or trust for each other, that's the key. So we, have, we better find out the, the way to do it. So I think that uh, maybe, as I said, sanctions prevent us from doing, uh, pursuing more the interactions than in the economic area or the other areas, but military area, we can do it. So maybe CBM, I mean, that's you know, confidence building measures, and also the, some kind of arms control you know, the negotiation can be very helpful for, for the, you know, the near future. Thank you. This is a, such an honor and also a good moment and best opportunity to me to stand up here, not just stand up, but to do presentation. And also, uh, I would like to thank to KDU for inviting me because it's the first time for me to come to Sri Lanka, really. It's the first time. So I really uh, am I'm really glad to come to Sri Lanka. <coughs> Okay, okay, before uh, presenting uh, my presentation about uh, the role of Bineka Tuaka or the role of uh, Unity in Diversity to strengthening security system in Indonesia and the challenge this in the future, I would like to a little bit introduce about my uh, institution. Indonesian Def Defense University just established uh, nine years ago, so it's very, very young. Uh, it is a different university is like a melting pot because the students come from both civilian and military, but most of them are civilian. So 70 or 75 percent are civilian and 20 percent or something 30 percent is pro military. So it's a little bit unique, and I think we are uh, we are very glad because so many civilian civilian now very very interested in learning or studying about defense. That's uh, a little bit about Indonesian Defense, uh, Indonesian Defense University. Okay, then. Uh, let me start. <coughs> Indonesia is the, large, uh, the largest archipelagic country in the world and consists of uh, 17,508 islands. See, it's very, very, very big. And also, Indonesian uh, people consist of hundreds of ethnic and we are now estimated have um, population about 260 million. So it's the fourth largest uh, population in the world under China, India, USA. <coughs> and also Indonesia uh, has about 500 ethnic group yeah, all over Indonesia. So you can imagine it is hard to control but uh, the professor, the previous uh, presenter said uh, it's hard to control, but maybe we can manage. So we try, I mean, Indonesian government try to manage this uh, such thing. <coughs> and Indonesia also is home of the largest uh, number of Muslim in the world, around 90 percent. Uh, in Indonesia are Muslim, 77% uh, is maybe Christian or Protestant, and the rest is 30% like uh, Hindus or Buddhism. <coughs> so diversity uh, in Indonesia is uh, really, really uh, hard to manage, but we had a motto we call Bineka Tunga Eka. What is the Bineka Tunga Eka? I mean, unity in diversity. What is uh, the... Uh, what is the essence of uh, unity or, uh, in diversity or unity or essence of Bineka Tunika is tolerance from all differences. That's the main key. So Bineka Tunika means we have to do, we have to be tolerant 
to all the differences. So that's like a bound yeah, or glue for Indonesian to be united. <coughs> I try to uh, a little bit uh, explain about uh, the history of Pinika Tukalika. The motto of Pinika Tukalika is known for the first time in the Majapahit uh, king or era that's uh, 700 years ago. That uh, motto meaning uh, diversity in religion. But now we believe diversity of belief, religion developed in the uh, Mojibite Kingdom is still uh, applicated to Indonesia now. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, the concept of Pindika Tukarika in strengthening the security system is not to implement the hard power or also soft power, but we try to implement what we call smart, uh, smart power. What is the smart power mean? Smart power mean is uh, combining of, of hard power and soft power. When uh, Indonesian government uh, apply uh, hard power, if uh, the threat like uh, terrorism, separatism, or <coughs> something is uh, uh, the similar to that. And so far is uh, like uh, giving them a socialization to all innocent people that we are different, but we, we still the ones. That's the, the essence of uh, Bineka Tungalika. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, give example uh, the Bineka Tunggal Ika apply to Indonesian people. I give uh, example is uh, two region. One is uh, Natuna. Here, I give Natuna. You know Natuna is uh, is part of Indonesia. is is uh, is far away from uh, the government center. is close to. Uh, part of Sumatra, but it's close to, to Aceh. In that region, the harmony is very, very good. Even though they are different uh, religion, they have uh, different uh, ethnics, but still, they are very, very good in relation and very, and very good in social, uh, doing social there. Bineka Tunggalika is not a uh, sector and exclusive for, uh, for uh, Natuna uh, people and they have uh, like a commitment to defend Indonesia as a one unitary that in Natuna. And also another thing is uh, in Karimun Jawa, Karimun Jawa is a uh, form through the migration process. Karimun Jawa Island is located between Java and Kalimantan Island. So it is possible that Karimun Jawa is used as a stopover by the trader. Tribe diversity in Karimun Jawa is a cultural condition that if do not manage properly can disrupt the process of social cohesiveness and community integration as a foundation for the creation of national integration. But in there we can see they are living very harmonious. They respect each other. And then uh, they implemented the values of Pinika Tungalika. Even though they have different tribe and cultural background, but they can realize a great social relation. They saw that the society, society in Kermun Jawa has a high social awareness and openness to accept differences. In other words, they have been able to accentuate multiculturalism in their life. This is an example how in Bineka Tungaika implemented into region. Even though we have uh, the motto uh, unity in diversity, but we have a challenge, of course. Challenge come from uh, in internal and external. 
But the most uh, major challenge in Indonesia normally come from internal. There are two. I give the two example for what we call the the, the big major challenge. One is uh, tribe. Indonesia has uh, many tribes, but Java is the the most uh, populous uh, people in Indonesia. They are the, the majority. So why is a so-called challenge? Because if they want to be separated from Indonesia, it is very easy. It is very easy because they are majority people. But because we have a motto, Bineka uh, Tunga so Indonesian government try to to do very, very hard to socialize Bineka Tunga Ika, to protect uh, that uh, majority taken out uh, of Indonesia. The second challenge is uh, religion. As, as I mentioned before, Sikh religion in Indonesia, Muslim is the, uh, the, the largest and the biggest. Now, some Yes, some some people or some Muslim try to to what to take or to invite or to ask uh, uh, the same Muslim to do or to make uh, what we call Islamic government or Islamic country. It is very very uh, challenging for Indonesia, so we try very hard as well to make them. Uh, to be tolerant to each other. So what uh, measures uh, should be taken by the government? <coughs> Indonesian government uh, has pointed uh, two institutional to, to implement Bineka Tunggalika. One is we call uh, uh, MPR. Here we are. I'm sorry. One is uh, we call MPR, uh, People Consultative Assembly. It's uh, one institution, institution to be appointed by government to socialize uh, Bineka Tunggalika. And then the second one is uh, Pancasila Ideology Development Agency is an institution that has responsible to president with the task of assisting the, pre the president in formulating the policy of Pancasila ideology development, carrying out coordination, synchronization, and controlling Pancasila ideological guidance in a comprehensive as sustainable manner. So once again, the measures to be taken by Indonesian government is to implement we call smart power. Hard power implementation is to protect unity of Indonesia from internal threat or from, from some region to be separated from Indonesia. And soft power is socializing uh, about Bineka Tunggal Ika to be a motto of Indonesia to push Indonesian people to be tolerant, not egocentric. So conclusion for <coughs> uh, my presentation is diversity of tribe, ethnic, culture, and race, and religion, religion that exists in Indonesia become either opportunity or challenges. These challenges rise especially when Indonesia needs togetherness and unity in order to face with the dynamic of life in the society, nation, and state. Both from internal and external, nowadays we are facing and trying to solve and, and the multidimensional crisis that has been going for a long time without the unity of the vision and mission of the entire of Indonesian people, it is impossible to get out from the crisis. The nation is built with a pillar of Binega Tunggal Ika. 
which has led us to becoming a nation that growing up among another nation. Strategies to managing security and defense system of Indonesia are directed to safely guarding, to safety guarding the Republic of Indonesia constitutional system based on spirit, soul, value, and for consensus that underline the founding of the Unitary Republic of Indonesia, which includes Pancasila, the 1945 Constitution of the Republic of Indonesia, keep up the Unitary State of the Republic of Indonesia, and continue developing priority and diversity with the principle of Bineka Tungaika. Thank you very much. Scholars, friends, uh, two weeks back when Professor Amal Javardhan invited me to uh, the, this seminar, I said that, uh, you know, it is too short. I don't have uh, the ready-made presentations in my cupboard. Uh, then he said, just uh, talk about what you are doing. Then I thought, I have been working and reading on the national security and human security. Then I thought, I will speak on, from my notes and share some views with you. First of all, I would like to thank the Vice Chancellor of uh, Kotalavra Defense uh, University and also Organization Committee of this conference uh, to give me, give me this opportunity to share my views with you. Having said that, I would like to come to my topic. National security is a critically important, constantly evolving and characteristically amorphous concept. It is a handy rhetoric face for politicians, an ultimate policy objective for military, and a key analytical concept and field of study for social scientists. From the very conception of the state, security remains one of its main functions. It has been argued that the state, the supreme political institution that claims the exclusive right to sovereignty, came into existence mainly to fulfill security needs of the society. To Thomas Hobbes, security is the raison d'etre of the state. Accordingly, the state is the principal security provider. At the same time, security of the state is a critical precondition to discharge its security functions. Then what is really meant by national security? Broadly speaking, national security denotes the ability of a nation to protect its internal values and assets from external threats. It is an axiom that military is the tool of national security. In line with the evolution of the state, the concept of security and the role of military have also changed. The origins of the present concept of security can be traced back to the formation of modern sovereign states known as nation state system. However, the present discourse of national security took its shape after, the, after 1945 in the Cold War context at the research and policy corridors of the United States. Accordingly, security of the state in an anarchic international environment was the focal concern of the national security. The only object of reference only object of reference of national security is the state. Security was defined as the protection of territorial integrity and sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis threats originated from external sources. Hence, security of the state depends on its power. Power is defined only in terms of military power. Hence, national security is not National security is nothing but the political military security of the state. Some profound, change, profound changes or developments that took place 
in international and national spaces in the last quarter of the last century have compelled to revisit the traditional concept of national security. This again, disintegration of the Soviet Union has marked the end of post-war phase in international politics. The theoretical, analytical, theoretical and analytical categories of national security developed in the Cold War countries lost their earlier validity and the inadequacy to understand security problems of non-Western societies became more and more evident with the passage of time. Resurgence of ethnicity in many parts of the world and the spread of ethnic conflict linked with Shoshanist state project practically questioned the very base of, of very basis of modern nation state system. The issue of how to reconfigure this concept of national security, not only to reconfigure, incorporate non-military non security threats, but also to bring other reference of references of security such as society and individual came to forefront in the change global context. Challenge to conventional national security emerged from th three directions. First, by presenting a report on common security, Farm Commission ignited the new discourse on security. Commission, having been firmly rooted in the social democratic tradition in Europe, first questioned the basics of prevailing national security analysis, especially its emphasis of military strategic superiority. Secondly, peace research school developed an alternative paradigm by bringing the social groups and individuals as units of analysis. The analytical, analytical frames developed by scholars such as Joanne Galton and Kenneth Baldwin that widened the discipline of disciplinary confines of security in studies. Concept of, concept of structural violence and the categorization of negative and positive peace question the narrow military strategic perceptions of security. Thirdly, human security discourse that evolved in UN framework placed the concept of security in a different plane by reconfiguring security from human-centered perspective by bringing in a number of references of security and various dimensions. Then, main thrust of my presentation is the is that human security is not an alternative to human, national security. They are, mutual they are mutually reimposing. The rejection of state is biased in traditional concept of national security does not mean that security of the state is not important. Security of the state is considered a very important prerequisite for, the, for other references of security. When the state is insecure, the entire society becomes insecure. Society, security of the state can be reconfigured, can be reconfigured from human security perspective to capture totality of human uh, totality of security paradigm. Real issue here is how to configure the state security of the state. Security of the state denotes something more than physical security of territory and its ruling class. On the one hand, the state is a legal abstraction. On the other, it has territorial basis and institutional framework of its own. Furthermore, idea of the state based on its organizational ideology constitutes an important element of the state. The state is more an idea held in common by a group of people than is a physical mechanism. Therefore, Barry Bufsan identified three elements of security of the state. Idea of the state, territory, and institutions and people. The idea of the state is the critical factor that establishes the legitimacy in the minds of its people. It binds territory with human and institutional base alone with the state. Uh, idea of the state is the basis of the ideology of the state. The security of the state must be achieved first, first of all in political ideological plane. It is the ideology of the state that decides the way in which human base is organized and orientation of institutional frames of the state. Ideology of the state must cut across ethnic boundaries and political loyalties. It, not, 
It should not be changed in line with the entry and exit of, exit of political, of governments and political leaders. Weak ideological basis of the state and its failure to unite all the people that reside within the boundaries of the state are the clear indication of a weak and insecure state. The key factor of legitimacy of the state domestically is the ability to present an ideological accept ideology acceptable to all in the country. Then, when the weak ruling bloc failed to present a healthy ideology for the state that would unite all citizens, cutting across ethnic divisions, then they need enemies of the motherland to rally people. Weak regimes see, weak regimes see enemies of the state everywhere. Conspir conspiracies against the state in every nook and corner. To them, the main task of the state is to identify and counter internal and external enemies who are waiting to destroy the country. There are four enemies used to destroy and control these enemies is justified. Accordingly, there are only two types of citizens, patriotic and unpatriotic. This creates fear and suspicion and thereby narrows the range of public debate and de democratic discourse. Then, in it, in itself become a national security issue. Other dimension of na national security is the security of the institutional frames of the state. No state can survive solely with its ideological foundations. To be functional, any state needs a set of complex formal and informal institutions. Security of institutions of the states constitute key aspect of political security of the state. Political security does not necessarily mean the security of the regime in power. It is based on credible and strong institutional network. For that, the dignity of the bureaucracy need to be respected. The legitimate institutions of the state is destroyed mainly by direct political interferences to establish administrative procedures, not by external threats. The politicization of institutions makes the entire mechanism of the state insecure and it ultimately become an integral element of national insecurity. A strong state needs independent and strong institutions which, would be man which could not be manipulated by those in power. In this backdrop, the principle of good governance and the rule of law occupy the center of new discourse of national security. In reading national security in line with the new security discourse, we need to give due consideration to the human, human ways as a unit of reference of security. When human beings, when human base of the state is insecure, the entire state, sorry, state cannot be secure. It is necessary to bring other reference of security such as individual and collective identities along with the state to grasp national security in a broader analytical frame. Security of the individual cannot be overlooked at the expense of security of the state as security of the individual ultimately, insecurity of individual ultimately undermines security of the state itself. Recognition of the individual as a reference object of Security has brought human rights into the national security agenda. Suppression of human rights in the name of national security leads to further breakdown of national security. Human rights captured, human security captures many aspects that are vital for survival of the people who remain outside the traditional security ana analysis. Human security and human development are closely related. Survival means protection from, protection from violence as well as from mal uh, malnutrition, disease, and natural disease, disasters. When reading it from insights of human security, the just position of security of the state with economic security is necessary. Idea of human security is closely related to two other equally important discourses of the day, namely human development and human rights. Underlying premise of human development is the progress must be fair, progress with equality. Human security emphasizes the complex relationship 
and often ignored, ignored linkages between good governance, human rights, and development. The focus of attention here is survival, livelihood, and dignity, and these three elements of human security are projected from point of view, point of view of the people. Traditionally, the national security concentrate on security of the state from external threats. Human security concentrates on the protection of individual and their economic survival and the recognition of ethnic and cultural heritage. This does not mean that human security simply ignored security of the state. The insights of human security could be employed to reconfigure state security more broadly and rationally in a different, different plane. Thus, human security and national security could be mutually reinforcing. Thank you. Madam Chair, fellow panelists, and respected colleagues, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to stand before you today to deliver the presentation on this momentous gathering. I would like to express my sincere appreciation to KDU for the excellent arrangements and outstanding hospitality accorded to me. It is indeed always a delighted to visit the beautiful country of Sri Lanka. Before delving into the details of the topic, the challenges of an island nation, the case of Maldives, let me briefly introduce my nation's Maldives. Most of you or you are aware that the Maldives is a tourist destination under the slogan of sunny side of life. However, these facts would highlight the truly unique island nation's characteristics of the country. It's located in the Indian Ocean, comprising of 1,190 1, islands and sandbank group of 26 atolls. It stretches across the length of approximately 800 kilometers kilometers uh, width uh, and length and uh, width of approximately 130 kilometers around 200 inhabited islands and over 100 more than 100 resorts islands island have an average height of 1.8 meter above the sea level population is approximately uh, 366,000 the total land area is 298 square kilometer Moving on to the concept of the national security, the, the definition by the Professor Muhammad Ayyub, which very aptly covers the span of the terms, as I quote, security or insecurity is defined in the relations of two vulnerabilities, both internet, internal and external, that threaten to the that threaten to or however potential to bring down the significant weaken state structure, both territorial and international. The eminent Professor Barry Buzan, in his book, The National Security in the Third World, the management of the in internal and external threat explains that the national security is a large a Western concept, particularly an American post in 1945 terms. In the context, the concept of was largely developed in the, in the response to the need and condition of the particular group of the state. The most widely agreed definition of the nation's security is the protect and preservation of the core values of the nations. Although in the past hundred years, the dominant force of international relations and the politics has been the nation state, the most wars were fought, fought to create and expand such states. The future challenges and risk of international region is stability to nations without borders or to the global village seems as likely to come from the other factors, from the extremist diverse of the radical motivation connected with anger and hatred, coupled with terrorism, ethnic and religious conflict, competition for the scale of resources, environmental pressure, and also from the spread of drug and crime. Hence, arguments for the bordering the concept of the national security calls for the inclusion of the wide range of additions. It ranges from economic security to human security and ecological security to security of vital resources. 
Island nations' insecurity is more immediate, real, and pressing. Besides the pres uh, pre precarious external security environment equally devastating the escapable, inescapable domestic political fragility, island nations' security problems are deemed to be much broader than the merely focusing on the external contacts since the domestic internal and or internal situation can equally be threatened or core values. Which considering the national security equation of the small island developing the state such as Maldives, it is necessary to consider the security of its large maritime zone addressing the issue of the such as poaching, drug trafficking, arms smuggling, piracy, and so forth. Hence, considering the extensive security of com complication of small island states and identifying the general working definitions, the explanation of national security forward the first uh, binary report of the Con Commonwealth Consultative, Gr uh, Consultative Group on small states draws the clear view the absence of threat, the capability of govern, protect, preserve, and advance the state and its people consists of with principles of respect to sovereignty and territorial integrity to the state. The traditional rea realist paradigm of the national security when it applied to small states such as Maldives seems to be far more problematic concept. Thus, there are arguments before bordering the concept of national security of a small state which calls for the inculcation of the wide range of other issues, such as range of the terrorism, religious extremism, public disorder, human rights violations, security of industries, ecological issues such as environmental degradation and natural disaster, and so on. The country formally, the, the country's formation of the formal security force date back in 21st April 1820. This was the initial by initiated by the Sultan Ibrahim uh, Nuruddin Iskandar. The recent ma day ma the recent day major changes in the country's defense posture was 1st September 2004 when the policing function was separated move under the ma mandate of Ministry of Home Affairs. Hence the national security was structured into the military force and renamed the Maldives National Defense Force in 21st April 2006. To give the strategic uh, guidance, the armed forces, number of key documents came out in 2008, First Armed Force Act 2008, and the second document, it was instrument, Instrumental Changes set up for the Strategic Defense Directive, which broadly guideline of the decentralization force of the lays down of the joint operational philosophy of the force. It also established the Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and two main fighting components. components. MNDF is comprises three main components, the ground elements organized by the Maritime Corps, uh, Marine Corps, and the Coast Guard, it is naval element, while the MNDF support units are service support and the support of services. In addition to this, the Special Forces was established in the National Strategic Asset of the Ministry of Defense. The main concept was to institute the resource of efficient and organization which core characteristics of sustainability and deployability. One of the most notable changes of the MNDF recent was brought to the four operational commands across the country, that is the Northern Area, Central Area, Southern Area, and the Mali Area. The unif according to the, with the unified action philosophy identified within the doctrine of the service of MNDF shall be provided in, the, in these regional areas under the joint operation approach. For the most part, the, for the most part terrorism and the, in the Maldives context is a byproduct of the religious extremism. The root of extremism forces have already started incised into the fabric of the Maldivian society in the outmost concern of the national security. The incident on the Himandu Island and the IED explosion in the Sultan Park in Mali in 2007 has rung the serious alarm bells highlighting the possible impact of the terrorism to the vital tourism sector. The Maldives is working closely partners with other countries through intelligence sharing and joint operation to the count counter these threats. There are growing concerns of the Maldives going abroad, the participate in, uh, abroad, Maldivians going abroad to the participate in the armed religious conflict 
hotspots around the world. A key factors underway to closely monitor these ca cases and especially the risk posed those fighting with the return back to the country. The National Counterterrorism Center was established in 2016 under the Ministry of Defense and National Security to counter the threat posed to the by the ter terrorism and the collaborate with the government organization, civil sectors, and our regional and international partners. More than 90% of the Maldivian territory is water. Hence, it is important to understand the threat challenges of the concern of the country's maritime domain, protecting and safeguard of the national interests of the Maldives in its maritime domain have become far more challenging of, for the Maldivian National Defense Force. With the coastline approximately 868 kilometers and the enormous exclusive economic zone in the middle of the vital sea line of communication, it is vital to ensure the surveillance of the Maldivian territory to protect its interests and to secure the sea. The primary constraints for the security agencies are limited resources and capabilities of the face and challenge of the evolving maritime security environment in the Indian Ocean region. Fishing and tourism is the two main industries of the, industries of the Maldives contribute the a mainstay of the economy and holds the major on the foreign currency earning. Hence, the protection of the preservation of these industries at the core of the countries of the nation's interest, ensuring the maritime law and are not violated and unauthorized persons do not uh, plunder the wealth of the Maldives Sea are uh, essentially viewed maritime security priorities. The Maldives Coast Guard ships have been regularly apprehending foreign fishing tra trawlers poaching in the EZ. The Maldives, like the maritime neighbor neighborhood friends, also have a vital stake at the security and stability of the greater Indian Ocean region, particularly if one, look at, uh, one looks at it in the geostrategic point of view, the technological changes, geographical realities, economic, globaliz economic globalization, shifting demographic, fragile environment, and finite resources are all importing, impacting the strategic equation of the Indian Ocean region. Maldives would oppose any move to subject and displace the littoral state of the Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean is the home of the world's most important sea line of communication, which half of the global trade and one of the third of oil trade passing through it. Maldives is actively engaged in ensuring the safe, uh, safety and securing of, of the Indian Ocean through numerous bilateral and multilateral engagements with neighboring countries, including joint surveillance programs and training exercises. The issue of maritime policy and concern around the Somalia western region of ocean or Gulf of Aden region and growing on its sophistication, sophistications and reach is, is a main concern to the nations like Maldives. The vast water and scattered islands of the Maldives greatly Im amplifies the risk of an risk from the pirate groups. Efforts are being undertaken towards ensuring the better surveillance through establishment of radar system and maritime patrols. Arms, narcotics, and human traffic is the Indian Ocean region is estimated to be on the increase and posing the risk, the, pe the peace and security, security of the countries in the region. Indication of particularly the note of 1.6 tons of narcotics discovered staged in a lagoon in the Maldives during 2006. Confrontation with an arms trafficking vessels within the Maldives territory in 2007. Vessels ran ground on a reef in the north of Maldives was found to be the smuggling of large quantity of drugs in 2018 this year. For the nation that predominantly survived through its earning from the tourism and fisheries in incidents of such nature are matter of serious national concerns. After looking, looking at the national security of the small island states and the main host of the threat of challenges facing, I would like to cap off, cap off with the primary limitations 
that are concerned with the comes of effective dealing with it. Lack of resources, equipment and infrastructure. This challenges to all the countries irrespective of its size, however it is. When it comes to small island states like Maldives, the problem is further exaggerated given its respectively vast geographically and limited resource. The next limitation is capacity developing development of personal and expertise. Widely spread of small pop uh, population con concentrations, impact of international and regional instability. Globalization have resulted the highly interconnected world, reducing the boundaries of the traditional borders. Maldives with Mo borders, Maldives with its, with its economy highly reliant on tourism industry, is greatly a risk from the global or regional instability. To wrap up. The, the, the presentation I will so summarize to its following points. National security is the context of small island states, far more problematic concept. Small islands of states securing the threat challenges far broader than the external context. Issue of we face range from terrorism, religious extremism, public disorder, human rights violations, security, industry, security of industries, ecological issues such as environmental degradation and natural disasters and so on. Challenges faced on the effectively, effectively countering these threats are further magnified due to the nature of the characteristics of island nation of the Maldives. Coming to the conclusion, I hope that within this short period, period I have been able to provide you an insight into the case of Maldives and its challenges as an island nation. Thank you for Thank you all for your ki keen attention and I wish you all the pleasant day ahead. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the uh, university for inviting me to give my perspective of what Malaysia's defense and security um, and peace. So what I will do is I will go and uh, um, describing how Malaysia looks at uh, defense and security, what are the factors that influence Malaysia's perception of security and uh, defense and security, what are our past threats to national security, what are our present and future threats to national security, and lastly I will conclude by looking the way forward. What do we do or what are the things that we need to do to safeguard our national Okay, the ASEAN region has uh, experienced political stability and economic growth, but non-conventional security issues are beginning to shape and influence the nature of threats to Malaysia national defense and security. Globalization has also linked Malaysia in a complex and uh, unpredictable way where local and international events have an uh, important impact on how we view national security. Now, in as far as uh, how Malaysia looks at defense and uh, security, we are influenced by three factors. The first one is the structural factors or our geographical location. The second is our historical perspective. And lastly, are uh, the issues driven in uh, national security. Now, looking at the structural element, uh, for your information, Malaysia consists of two parts. One is uh, Peninsular Malaysia, which is uh, basically uh, this part here. And uh, next, we have East Malaysia, which is on the island of, uh, Kaliman of uh, Kalimantan. And Malaysia is separated by the South China Sea and it is also a strike two very important uh, waterways. One is the Malacca Strait and secondly the uh, South China Sea which uh, basically is an international route that we have part control over uh, the Malacca Strait. Now population wise we are about 32 million people and we have land borders with Indonesia Thailand and uh, also Brunei. Now, 
the uh, location of uh, Malaysia uh, is where our national resources are. Our oil, gas and fisheries, which constitute about 12% of our gross domestic product. So by nature of our location in the center of Southeast Asia, with all the competing elements, national security is also a, an important element. And our unique geographical location has meant that it had to be vigilant at all times towards both external, but more importantly, internal threats to Malaysia's security. Next, uh, we'll just look at the historical perspective. Now, Malaysia's security and the strategic posture has been, uh, has been one based on threat of communism. We have faced two, we call the emergencies, the communist insurgency in Malaysia through two phases, one in 1948 and the next one was in 1968. We went through two uh, communist inspired insurgency. Now, the first emergency was declared in 1948 when communist inspired attacks, political insurrection and overall mayhem threatened economic, political and security stability. Through the efforts, through the whole government effort and through our uh, the efforts of um, the Malaysian Security Forces, we managed to overcome the communist insurgency in, 1966, in 1960. However, in 1968, there was a uh, second emergency uh, declared when the Communist Party of Malaya reignited the racial disharmony, political subversion and economic stability. It, however, ended in 1989 when the Communist Party of Malaya surrendered under the Hat Nyai Agreement in uh, Thailand. Now, we were one of the only country that has managed to overcome a communist-inspired insurrection. And how do we do this? How we do this is not by uh, pouring in more troops into the jungle, but in the hearts and minds of the people. We, we, we try to win the hearts and minds of the population by promoting not only military and political advances, but also social welfare as well. The hearts and minds was transformed and linked towards security and development with nation building under what we term as the case ban, or which is keselamatan and pembangunan, or security and development. We link this, uh, the uh, operations against uh, communist insurgency through security and development. We ensure that, that there is security and with it we bring in development in order to win the hearts and minds of the local population. Now, it also focuses on the sum total of all measures undertaken by the government agencies to protect society from subversion, lawlessness and insurgency. That has been the hallmark of the Malaysian um, uh, operations against communist insurgencies in 1948 and also in 1968. As I've said, it was designed to cut off the communist supply chain and security forces dealt with the communist insurgency through well-planned strikes and search and destroy operations. The communist affected areas and communities were rehabilitated and included in various government programs to improve their quality of life. The strategy that was employed by the Malaysian government was also copied during the Vietnam, in, in Vietnam, and also in some parts of Afghanistan. However, up to now, it, may, it is not as successful as what uh, it has been successful in Malaysia. Okay, the, the third element that influence our, the way we look at social uh, at, uh, security and stability is the political and social arrival. The case of national integration and societal cohesion, politicization of race and religion, spillover effect of neighboring countries, political and economic crisis, and religious fundament, uh, fundamentalism has got an impact on our national security and stability. Now I will go quickly to our present and future security challenges. What are our uh, security challenges to Malaysia at the present moment. And as far as traditional threat to Malaysia, there are traditional threats, but it is manageable in the sense that uh, the overlapping claims uh, and also 
crisis between uh, neighboring countries, this is manageable through the process, the diplomatic process that we have. The main threat to uh, Malaysia at the present moment is the non-traditional -tra threat to security. Now, increasingly in a borderless world, human trafficking, terrorism and money laundering are interlinked with drug and arms smuggling, cybercrime, as well as online share trading. These, uh, in turn, are related to the movement of people, tourists, students, merchants and like. Hence, globalization acts as a, function, well, as a fulcrum holding these bonds and the international community needs to formulate a new perspective to appreciate these linkages. Now, the most uh, important threat to uh, our national security is terrorism. We have been faced with uh, a couple of uh, terrorist activities in Malaysia and uh, terrorist attacks are, as I said, the most challenging non-traditional security threat. It is a serious challenge to the fundamental ethos of which Malaysia and how Malaysia deal with this threat demands us to think outside of the box. Now, it also demands a whole government approach involving not only a multitude of agencies, but the multilateral participation of many governments to eliminate or reduce the possibility of terrorist organization as establishing operating bases across the border. So terrorism is one of the most important challenges to Malaysia's national security. Uh, secondly is globalization. Globalization also uh, poses a threat to us. In a changing global structure has added another pressure to Malaysia's political and economic security dimension and has affected Malaysia's actual and perceived threats. Now, politically, Malaysia is still fragile and economically, the country is susceptible to a fluid international environment. And uh, globalization could lead to increasing feeling of insecurity amongst Malaysian population as a result of perceived in inability of the state to deal with the threat effectively. Next is uh, one of the most important uh, threat to, uh, national, uh, of, uh, to Malaysia is national, uh, not utility, but national unity. Uh, Malaysia consists of various uh, races. We've got the major race being uh, Malays, we've got the Chinese, we've got the Indians, we've got many other races. And to create a, uh, a nation state uh, which have all the races together as Malaysian is one of the most important challenge to us. National unity has be, always been an internal threat to us that if it's not managed well, will result in uh, instability in, in the country. One uh, clear example was in 1969, there was a major racial uh, um, uh, insurrection and uh, many people were killed and the country was at the verge of uh, uh, breaking up and we had to declare an emergency to rectify the problem. So therefore, national unity is an important element towards Malaysia's national security. Uh, next is uh, another threat to Malaysia's security is immigration. Uh, we have got um, the influx of migrants, uh, particularly the illegal uh, one, has become one of the major security concerns. According to our statistics, in uh, 20, uh, 2016, there were about 2.8 million uh, uh, immigrants in Malaysia, working in Malaysia, of which 1.5 million are legal and the other 1.3 are illegal immigrations. These are the ones that threaten our national security. And uh, of course, the next is uh, environmental issues. Another new but major concern to Malaysia's national security is uh, environmental issues that covers not only environment but also security aspects of health, drug trafficking, refugees and others. Issues of uh, environmental degradation in particular have been given a serious thought by the Malaysian political leaders which could produce multi multiple effects on uh, Malaysian social economy such as the sudden rise of medical bill due to increasing numbers of asthmatic patients and the loss of revenue due to lower arrival of tourists in, in uh, the country. Environmental issues is another aspect that could threaten our uh, national security. And uh, next is transnational crime. Uh, another dimension of security to Malaysia security is uh, transnational organized crime such as drug and small arms uh, smuggling, 
and human trafficking, which has become a major security uh, uh, concern. Now, how do we manage this issue? Those are the threats that are present in Malaysia. How do we manage? What are the things that we do? We have used ASEAN uh, as a uh, primary platform for regional cooperation. And it is a strong and successful ASEAN that is not only an economic necessity, but a stabilizing influence, but also a strategic imperative. We view ASEAN as a uh, platform for regional cooperation, and we want ASEAN to be a strong uh, economically and also uh, as a strategic imperative. Now, we also conduct defense diplomacy. As a, uh, defense diplomacy has, uh, has long be, been a mainstay to Malaysia's defense posture, the notion that the armed forces of nations have the ability to contribute to uh, international security not only by the use of force, but also by promoting a more cooperative international environment. Uh, Malaysia looks at defense diplomacy not as an alternative to the more traditional role of the armed forces, but supplements it by a host of other activities that contribute to the prevention of conflict by building and uh, maintaining trust. Okay, I'll go very fast. Um, next, we go on uh, regional and global engagement. Uh, Malaysia's foreign policy has consistently sought to pursue its national interests based on the principle of humanity, justice, and equality. Uh, we are also blessed with strong leadership. Uh, Malaysia has been, uh, uh, for the past 61 years, where leadership is the use of political power to bring society up to achieve values we hold dear and not to manipulate societal values to achieve personal powers. Okay, uh, in conclusion, uh, since 1961, uh, uh, after 61 years of independence, uh, Malaysia has been blessed with a relative peace and harmony. Present and future uh, threats will always remain, although they may take a different form and from a different source. And we will continue with uh, the numerous engagement and transnational cooperation in meeting the new security challenges cooperation in the region, and beyond. With that, I thank you very much for your kind attention.